This is why I like to make cookies afterwards. There's still quite a bit of butter on there, so if I make a batch of cookies, then I feel like I get most of it off. Hello, howdy, and welcome back to my kitchen. I'm Catherine, the Euro Garden Homesteader. It is early this morning, so I'm trying to talk a little quieter, but uh, I'm getting some baked oatmeal going. So I thought I would take you along for that. I'm probably not going to do much talking, but this is just a uh, modification of a couple of recipes, kind of uh, amalgamating them together. The first recipe we were doing was uh, kind of loose. I don't know how to describe it. It was custardy. So this one I'm trying to uh, modify to get the flavors we want, but the texture hopefully a little firmer. So. We'll see. So I got one mashed banana in there. I'm going to get one cup of peanut butter. Since my peanut butter already has sugar in it, I'm going to skip the sugar content because I think between the peanut butter and the banana, I should have enough in here. It doesn't need to be a super sweet baked oatmeal. So. I am using crunchy. Use whatever you want. The uh, original recipe calls for almond. That seems like a, an awful lot of almond butter. Almond butter is pretty expensive, so my kids will be fine with peanut butter. I'm going to make a flax egg, so I'm going to go put some water in this. These, this is two tablespoons of flax meal, and I'm going to put in, I believe I need to put in six tablespoons of water. Right. And that needs to sit until it gels a little. I'm going to get in a teaspoon of vanilla. The original recipe actually calls for cinnamon, but I'm going to make it chocolatey. About two to three tablespoons of cocoa. Need one and a half cups of old fashioned oats. Ish. Quarter teaspoon of salt. Fish. Let's see how this is doing. Oh, it's getting there. I put a little less water in. I was concerned it might be too liquidy. Because again, I don't want this to be too liquidy. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be too liquidy. Okay, so this is going to go in a 9x9 or an 8x8, whatever you have. It's the smaller pan, not the big pan, so. And 350 degree oven. I don't know how long, because I didn't look at the recipe, but the last time I've been doing baked oatmeals was, uh, it was about 40 to 45 minutes, so expect it to take a little while. A lot stiffer than what we've been getting, so hopefully this will be less custardy. I'm going to mix it in well so I don't have any banana chunks or peanut butter chunks. One. Some chocolate chips. They are mini chocolate chips, but pretty much you have. It says two thirds, but I'm try a half cup, see what we got. It's already got chocolate flavor in it, so. Well, I hope it's the right consistency. I'm going to put this in my pan. And my oven preheated, so away we go. I've got a busy day ahead of me. Uh, I'm going to be also making some spreadable butter. Uh, I've also got some Swiss steak to make for dinner. So hopefully I can take you along for all of that. Okay, so hopefully this is more, more on the cookie bar texture than on the custardy texture. Okay, I'll show you how it looks when it comes out. Kind of curious because it doesn't have any leavening in it. So it's a good thing I read the directions. It called for only 25 to 30 minutes, but it turned out great. I think it could have probably used a slight splash of water just to help it a little bit, but the texture is great. So I think this is going to be the recipe that I will go to from now on. Okay, it is time to get the Swiss steak going. It's been, it's been a few hours since breakfast, obviously. Um, so I'm starting this about five hours before dinner, because by the time I get this all cooked up, 
and in the pan, and then in the oven. It'll probably be closer to four and a half hours, but we'll see. See how long it takes to prepare. I'm going to get uh, the butter in the pan, some oil, and I'm using top round that has been cut into steaks. So, like, we literally buy a slab of top round and process it ourselves. So it, it's just sitting in flour right now, but that's all I'm doing. I'm just going to dredge it in flour, fry it, and once it has a super crispy coating on it, I'm going to put it in a cast iron Dutch oven, because that's what I have, and hope it doesn't destroy my seasoning again. So yeah, just make sure it's uh, well covered with flour. For the frying process, you want to just not turn it as much as you can. So uh, get it really, really, really brown on one side, turn it once, really brown on the other side, and that's it, put in the cast iron. It doesn't have to be cooked all the way. You're going to be braising it in the oven for hours, and that's where it will cook and tenderize and all that good stuff. So, get this going. Now I'm using a non-stick, but when I was taught to make this, my mother-in-law uses a cast iron as well. But my cast iron, the coating is not that good, and it's been sitting in the back of my pantry for a while, so it's kind of covered in stuff. A little dirty. I'm gonna pull it out and clean it. I'm gonna start using it again. Okay, my steak is a little on the frozen side, but that's okay. And then once I'm finished cooking up the steaks, just browning them off, I will make a nice gravy to cook it in, and it'll just braise in the gravy. Everything will be covered in the oven, so. It's a pretty simple recipe. You can uh, season it how you like. We keep the seasonings pretty simple, but that's just that's just the way I was taught to do it, so. And I have about a cup of flour here with nothing else in it, but this flour, when I'm done with it, will go into making the gravy for the pot. So don't worry about feeling like you're wasting gravy or wasting flour. I don't think my pan was hot enough. Oh well. Now because this isn't very fatty, I don't have to worry about crowding the pan too much. But I do want to leave a little bit of space. I think that's all I can fit. So another three pieces left, I think. But I'll bring you back when I flip it so you can see how dark I want to get it. And then I'll bring you back when I do the gravy. I don't think anyone wants to sit here and watch meat cook, so. Let me get my butter in. Get some oil and my flour. Okay, make sure to cook that up, get rid of all the flour flavor, the raw flour taste. And Season with a little salt and pepper and onion powder at this point. Okay, it's going to go in a 325 degree oven for like four hours. And that's that. I am making spreadable butter. So I don't know if you have ever had a chance to buy spreadable butter in the store. It is literally butter with oil. Now the first time we got introduced to it was we found it at a discount store for a really good price. So, of course we bought some because it was butter. I didn't realize it had oil in it, but boy it was really nice to take butter right out of the fridge and be able to spread it right away. Well, once we got through all the discount stuff and you realize how much that stuff costs brand new, well, I looked into how to do it myself because really it can't be that hard. So, you pretty much just need your favorite butter. Salted or unsalted, does not matter. If you get unsalted butter, then obviously you need salt and oil. That's it. 
It should be a neutral tasting oil if you don't want to taste the oil, like literally if you just want the butter flavor. But if you don't mind having a flavored oil, like something with a little bit of um, olive oil flavor or something like that, go ahead because you're making it for you. So I have one pound of butter in here and I will be creaming this up until it's really nice and smooth. And then I will be adding the oil to it. So this is going to be noisy, so I'm, I'll just sort of cut this part out, but I'll show you how it goes as I'm creaming. Okay, once you think you have it creamed, you want to go through and scrape down all the sides and make sure there's not any uncreamed sections because it will not it will not get creamier when you add the oil. So if you have little chunks of butter that didn't get smooth and creamed, your spreadable butter will have little chunks of butter. So I just like to go through, work it all down the sides, try to get it out of the beaters. And then I will cream it up again for just a little bit longer to make sure I get all those lumps out and it's nice and smooth. Okay, that looks pretty good. I don't know if you can tell, but it kind of, because I used the higher speed and it was already smooth and creamy, I was able to um, get it to splat out from the whisks. Okay, so I am going to get my oil. And it is one cup of oil per pound of butter. So... This is just an oil bottle I fill up with a neutral tasting vegetable oil that I use for cooking. You use what you want to use. So I like to add about a quarter of a cup at a time and blend until it's smooth and then add more each addition. Okay, pretty good. Again, scrape it down before adding more because if you have chunks, it will not come out. I have learned this the hard way. Trying to set a good example. I'm going to blend that again. Make sure it is smooth before adding the rest of my oil. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, I'm going to add the rest of my oil. Okay, so I see some spots on the column here that I did not get very well, which means I probably will still have a few chunks. Seems like I always get one or two each time I do this. Not to worry. If you're spreading it on toast, it uh, melts somewhat quickly. Okay. Okay. So, what I like to do is, I put this in mason jars. But... The key is, now that I have all this butter all over everything, I like to make a batch of cookies. Take advantage of some of the extra butter residue that's on everything. That way I don't feel like I'm wasting butter. Because I don't know where how much butter is where you are, but it's kind of pricey here. It does seem like it came down a little bit, but not, not much. Okay, okay I gotta get some jars. You can see, it's pretty liquidy. But when it's in the fridge, it'll firm up, and then you only need to take it out for like maybe a minute or so, and then it's nice and spreadable. Do you have a few lumps? I obviously missed scraping, but what I like to do is I like to take my canning funnel and put it in jelly jars. That way we're only taking out a small amount at a time. And I just leave it in the fridge. So we need it. This way I know it is spreadable. This is why I like to make cookies afterwards. There's still quite a bit of butter on there, so if I make a batch of cookies, then I feel like I get most of it off. It's the central column that's actually really hard to scrape down when it's something really wet like this. I feel like I don't have a problem when it's cookie dough or, you know, batter, but something this wet, it just seems like it sticks a lot more. There you go. So I will keep this aside because I will use it for the cookies and then I will just clean this up and get ready for cookies. Okay, so making protein cookies and I got some peanut butter that needs to get used up as well. So the I'm using crunchy, but obviously use whatever you like. We got a bunch of protein powder because well it was on sale, which 
it was a good price, and I've been trying to increase my protein, so I figured it would be a good way to do it, because, you know, eggs have been kind of pricey lately, so we haven't been doing eggs for breakfast as much. Now, this does call for eggs, but I'm going to be making a flax egg, kind of like what I did with the baked oatmeal this morning. So, a uh, flax egg will be, it is, I believe, one tablespoon of flax meal, which I just ground flax seeds to get my flax meal, and three tablespoons of water, I believe. So, i get my peanut butter going. I have my ground flax meal, so I'm going to add, this is actually two tablespoons, so I'm going to add almost six tablespoons of water. I feel like that might be a little too much, so again, I'll just add a little bit less and then scale up from there. Okay, so I put in five tablespoons of water to my two tablespoons of flax, and it just needs to sit for a little bit and thicken up. In the meantime, I'm going to get my peanut butter in here and going a little bit so I can try to get some of the extra butter off of everything. I'm probably just going to make a big peanut buttery mess, but... Okay, it calls for half a cup of protein powder. This is already sweetened, so I will not be adding in any sweetener, because not only is this sweetened, but my peanut butter has sweetener in it, so I just don't see the point in adding extra sweetener. Okay. There's that. Okay, it calls for two tablespoons of cocoa. I did that last time. Followed the recipe, and I did not feel it was chocolatey enough. Oops. So, I'm going to add a quarter of a cup. Or whatever that ended up being, because that was probably a little bit more, honestly. Okay, I am going to get this going really slowly so I don't poof everything all over the place. I'm going to put in some vanilla, probably a teaspoon. And my egg. There we go. Okay, get that combined again. Yeah, that's looking a lot better. So I want to switch out from the whisks to my batter ones because this is, I don't want to break these. Now's the time to get all the rest of the butter worked in, get everything scraped down. Okay, so it does call for Chuck's chips, which they can be added now or skipped, depending on your preference. I will probably add that last tablespoon of water. This does look like it's a little on the uh, extra stiff side. So I'm going to put in one more tablespoon of water and mix it up and call it good. So this will be my sixth tablespoon, so that is a full two eggs. Okay. This is what it looks like. It's a pretty stiff cookie dough, but adding that extra bit of water was just enough to loosen it up. Get this all worked down into a ball. There's still a little bit of butter on my spatula here, so I'm going to work that in a little. What I like to do is put them on a cookie sheet, roll them into balls, and then freeze them. That way they don't go bad while I'm waiting to eat them, number one. Number two, it also means I can't just sit there and decide I'm going to eat the whole batch. I just have a small ice cream scoop, cookie dispenser thing, whatever you want to call it, and I just go through and slightly overfill it, but not by much, and I just put them on here. I will roll them into balls after, and then that will go in the freezer. Once it's all frozen, I put it in a bag, and then I can cook it up later. So it does go in the oven at 350. For about 10 to 12 minutes. If I'm coming straight from the freezer, I'll do 12. But if your oven runs a little hot, which mine doesn't, then you might only need 10. So obviously this is, you just have to know your oven. If a cookie that normally says it takes 10 minutes takes 10 minutes, then you know, you're, you're good to go. It also depends on how gooey versus crispy you like as well. Some people just, I really like a gooey cookie, but I do like to have a little bit of crisp to it. 
not a fan of super thin cookies that are just nothing but crisp. That's that's not the perfect cookie, cookie for me. So this one is it's a slightly mounted cookie. I do flatten them down a little bit because they don't they don't spread a ton, but it will have that soft interior, but it won't have the crispy edges. So you have to decide what you like in a cookie. Now, I believe this is only supposed to make 12 cookies, which obviously I have more than 12 here, but that is at a two tablespoon portion. So I think this is actually one and a half tablespoons. I'm not sure, I've never actually checked to see how big this is. I will have the recipe linked below so you can go and check it out yourself. Uh, I did make changes to it, so you know you're. If you like the changes I made, obviously go ahead and make them. But if not, just uh, follow the recipe. So this one's going to be a little on the smaller side, which is fine. Uh, might actually just split it up. Yeah. So I roll them, and then I flatten them a little, and then I just get rid of the cracks. So I normally just yeah create a disc. So give it a roll, give it a flatten and then kind of patty cake it into a disc. Now, I, because I have the Swiss steak in the oven, I probably won't cook one of these up right away to show you, but I will definitely cook one up later and show you what they look like, just so that you can get an idea of how much they spread. I'll cook it from frozen, so you'll see. So uh, these will just sit in the freezer until dinner time, and then I will probably pull one out. Uh, they won't be fully frozen, but at least you'll kind of get an idea of what they look like from frozen. So, there you go. That is a pretty simple protein cookie. So if you're looking for a way to increase your protein content without all the sugar, this, this, is, this is a good way to go. You can add the chocolate chips if you desire a little extra oomph on the chocolate, but I opted to go for the cocoa this time, so we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Maybe it's a little too bitter now because I didn't add extra sweetener to offset the bitterness of the cocoa, but we'll see. It's just a learning process. This is the protein cookie, fresh from the oven. You can see it didn't really spread very much, but it is soft. So, And here is Swiss steak for dinner with some nice fresh sourdough bread with spreadable butter. You can see it makes a nice gravy and the meat is just fork tender. I hope you give this recipe a try and I hope you like and share so other people can also find this recipe. And I hope I will see you next time on the Arrow Garden Homestead.